This is the second chapter of the Porn Addiction series by John Doyle himself, Johan Doyle here on the job. Johan Doyle uh, to uh, take care of this for you. Let's talk about let's talk about porking a little bit, shall we? First, we have to summarize basically what pornography does to your brain in terms of addiction. We'll start at the very tip of the iceberg. So first, note the tip of the iceberg. That pornography does measurable damage to various parts of your prefrontal cortex. The good news is that this damage has been shown to be impermanent if the addiction is broken. But the bad news is that it makes it incredibly difficult to break and even acknowledge the reality of the addiction. For example, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is associated with self-discipline, self-control, and compulsion. <laughs> it's the tip of the brain. <laughs> Just the tip of the porn. Impulsivity will lose tissue and cause you to be more compulsive with your decision making. The ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is associated with self-monitoring of behavior, will also lose tissue and cause you to have impaired self-monitoring, which basically means that you'll be less aware of what you're doing, which will make you less able to hold yourself accountable and behave properly. The medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with your awareness of your physical and emotional state, will also lose tissue and cause you to be more likely to be in a state of denial about your problem and to instead prioritize pursuing your addiction. And also your ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with motivating you to pursue that which is beneficial to you, will be damaged as well and cause you to be instead motivated to pursue your addiction. So that's very important to note. And moving on, we get into the fact that basically you're classified as a mammal. And technically speaking, rats are also mammals. But since we're on yes. Team Human, we don't want to do potentially unethical testing on ourselves. So instead, we do a lot of testing on rats because they spawn quickly. They're inexpensive. They're easy to house. Do, do rats have porn Coffee, addiction? Baby. TJ Ascension, thanks so much for the 24 months, dude. Most importantly, though, they're very closely related to us in terms of biological and genetic makeup. And for that reason, you can replicate a lot of symptoms of the human condition in rats. It's interesting that he knows this and he says, says this out loud, but he's still like Team Jesus, you know what I mean? Very weird. And there's something observed in rats, but also in many other mammals, that has been called the Coolidge effect. And it is an example of how continuous sexual novelty can drive the behavior of mammals. So if you take a male rat, put him in a cage with a female rat, he's going to assert himself because rats don't have a Me Too movement. And he will continue to... Whoa! Whoa. I, I, I look, look, it, I, that's not the joke you want to make about that. Um, they don't have a me too. Movie. They don't have the, mo the morality to understand consent is probably more, more um, easy. But so the way he made that joke just made it sound like obviously, and you guys are, are hip to the jive as it were. Uh, the, the, when you make a joke like that, it just sounds like um, you think that rape would otherwise be a good thing. Um, but you, there's a Me Too movement, so ah, don't do it. Jesus Christ. Assert himself until he gets bored, and even you know, if the female rat is like, what are we? He, he'll just be done. He'll be totally bored with her. Doesn't want. To Holy fucking shit! I just got here, and I'm already sick with the actual literal fuck. Yeah, devious chillster. With her, but then if he's around oh, a different yeah. female rat, he will reassert himself with her until he gets bored again. You can literally repeat this process <clears> with new female rats until the male rat collapses from exhaustion. This is because his top genetic priority is reproduction, and new female rats allow him to do that. Now, of course, human beings are a bit more sophisticated than rats. We actually have a Me Too movement. Our mating process is more complex, and we're part of the about five percent of mammals with the capacity for long-term bonds. But our brains are still affected by the Coolidge effect, which gets its name from President Calvin Coolidge, based. And the story goes that he was touring a farm with his wife. And the farmer showed his wife a rooster that spent all day, every day mating with hens. And his wife supposedly said, tell that to Mr. Coolidge. And so the farmer did. And then Coolidge responded by asking if it was with the same hen. The farmer said no. And he replied, tell that to Mrs. Coolidge. Pretty epic joke. <laughs> Thoughtfully quality donut. Thanks for the four months. Fuck you, John. <laughs> Women take the that L did. yet again. But anyways. It's whoa, whoa, whoa. Women take the L yet again. I mean, that was, uh, okay. Takeaway is that continuous sexual novelty tends to drive the behavior of mammals. Like, like it was, it was not really an L. I think, I think Calvin Coolidge here was just talking about his take on monogamy. That's all, okay? With the idea being that your best case scenario for continuing the bloodline is if every female is pregnant. Now, young man, this desire that you have to get every female pregnant arises largely from a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine amps up the centerpiece of a very primitive part of your brain known as the reward circuitry, which is where you get your cravings and your pleasure, but also your addictions. Mm -hmm. This part of your brain is what makes you want to do the things that keep you alive and get women pregnant, basically. <laughs> as a human, your list of priorities are like food, sex, love, friendship, novelty. These are called natural rewards, and they are different from addictive chemicals. But the problem is that addictive chemicals can hijack the same circuitry in your brain as we talked about earlier. So the whole reason that you have dopamine is to motivate you to do whatever serves those interests, basically. Lots of dopamine when you eat candy, not a whole lot when you eat cauliflower. That's just the way it works. I get dopamine from eating cauliflower. I'm going to be totally honest. I'm a big fan of vegetables. Last night I ate mostly vegetables for dinner. Although there was some moho chicken I made, but yeah, mm, I love a veggie. You guys like veggies? You should eat veggies. Tells you where to direct your attention and what to pursue. And it also helps you remember those things by rewiring your brain via new or stronger nerve connections. And sexual stimulation and orgasm add up to the biggest natural release of dopamine and opioids available to your reward circuitry. So you can start to see why we need to be careful. Because a lot of people describe dopamine as the pleasure chemical. That's not actually accurate because it's much more about seeking and searching for that pleasure, not the pleasure in itself.
As you get closer, your dopamine rises with anticipation and it motivates you to keep going towards whatever you want, whether that's immediate pleasure or long-term goal. And it does this by attaching to receptors in your brain to stimulate electrical impulses. He's just ex explaining how brains work. Uh, Chris, yeah, thanks so much for the 50 biddies. Uh, found the study exciting. It's from 2014. Hasn't been replicated. Doesn't claim porn addiction brains shrink. Just found that porn addicts had smaller regions of the brain. Whether porn caused this or as a smaller portions caused the addictive behavior was undetermined. I'm not surprised. Meaty, thanks for giving one to respect. Appreciate that, man. Uh, <laughs> what you end up feeling as the actual pleasure is the release of the opioids, um, which also bind to the receptors in the reward circuitry of your brain. So dopamine compels you to find water, and then opioids are the relief feeling that you get upon quenching your thirst. Dopamine is what makes you want to get the female pregnant. Opioids are the feeling that you get upon doing so. You get the point. Dopamine makes you want stuff. Opioids make you like stuff. But the problem with that is that they aren't so easily separated in our brains. So dopamine causes us to desire and seek things, but dopamine is also a stronger system than our opioid system, which means that we're always seeking more than we are satisfied. And the reason for that is that seeking and desiring is more likely to keep us alive than just sitting around satiated, satisfied. <coughs> in a day is doing nothing. Okay. But the problem is that this imbalance when overstimulated leads ultimately to addiction because the desires and the cravings increase while the pleasure you get decreases. Uh, this is why some people uh, like it to take a while. Just saying. It's not about the nut necessarily, okay? It's about the hunt. <laughs> <laughs> it's about gathering, okay? If you're a squirrel, it's about the search for the nut. Not finding the nut, okay? <laughs> nut hunt. True. So you want something more and more, but you don't like it as much as you used to, so you compensate by craving more of it, and the cycle continues. Another thing... It's for the love of the game, you know? It's not about whether you win or lose. It's about how you play the game. Correlation is not causation. Thanks, Thrace. I agree we mentioned earlier that plays a big role here is novelty. That's the Coolidge effect. Dopamine surges for novelty. Without novelty, it diminishes over time. They've done studies where they'll show a group of men part of an X-rated movie and measure their dopamine and it gets lower every time they play it back and then they play part of a different one and it shoots right back up. And it's also true that men will ejaculate faster in greater volume and with faster sperm when viewing a new naked girl pretty as opposed to the same one. So basically... <laughs> This is masturbation, not sex, okay? <laughs> oh my god. Your brain can't tell the difference between watching pornography and having sex. And so, in the span of a shameful afternoon with a few extra tabs open, you can have more sexual partners, according to your brain, than your ancestors would have had in their entire lives. And if you think your brain has the hardware to handle this, you are mistaken. Okay. So it, it, it's not, <laughs> I don't know how to describe this. It's about a variety of experience and uh, expectation. And uh, I mean, there's some things you like what you like and you just go back to the well all the time. and It's always going to be quenching and delightful. Okay. And then there's some things when, ooh, something new happened. That's nice. I like that. And then there's some things where it's like, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it. There's, there's, there's like, you all have sexuality to some degree, and so you all tend to understand what I'm talking about. Um, I, this seems like hyper simplistic to just go like, well, if you see a different pair of boobies, you're going to come a lot. Like, what, dude? Like, sure, maybe, yeah. Op thumbs, thanks for following. Like, it's, it's, just, not, it's just deeper than that. It isn't my brain playing a trick on me, right? That, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, there, there's, there's aspects of sexuality where the the provocative nature of, I don't know, a, a new experience in general or the anticipa anticipation mostly of any experience is is kind of the thing, right? Um, I would say if if you are someone who um, uh, who enjoys sex um it's more about the build up to uh i guess i guess an orgasm than it is about the orgasm itself and in different ways to achieve that you're going to to of course find quality among that now that said it doesn't mean that you i don't know i i think he's sort of implying here that that like it's also very inherently anti like like marriage or something which isn't really the case i i don't know he's he's 
he's basically making a very strong case for our biological predisposition to um, find multiple people attractive. I mean, that's really it. Uh, John's naivete is cute in that he thinks his ancestors had only one sexual partner when his parents were likely conceived during an orgy and his grandpa is, isn't is likely his grandpa. What the fuck? <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe. <laughs> Xandris, thanks. I mean, maybe an ancestor during an orgy, sure. Uh, Xandris, thanks so much for the 24 months. Um, I feel like it's uncool in an orgy to be to be, um, to be be routinely inseminating folks unless they are like, yeah, do that. You know what I mean? I, I just feel I just feel like that's that, that might go against orgy protocol unless everybody involved is like on some sort of prophylactic, if that makes sense. <laughs> right, if you're not using a condom, yeah, sure. Yeah, that seems, you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't seem safe. <laughs> that's why you sign the release forms. Oh, boy. Um, it's that's, That seems, yeah, that seems against code. I'm just tossing that out there. This gets back into the supernormal stimulus. Tribal ancestors were not monogamous, of course. Right, we touched on earlier. Well, I don't think he's. I don't think he is. I think he's just white. It's not just the endless novelty that makes this so bad, but also the adjacent emotions and stimuli as well. Since dopamine also fires up for things like surprise or shock factor, violations of your expectations. You never thought you'd see something like this. Anxiety. Maybe this goes against your values or even your sexuality. Also, generally searching and seeking things out. All. Of uh, I'm pretty sure it will be unlikely that you find something sexually arousing if it goes against your sexuality. What it probably goes against is your outward presented sexuality, not your internal, actual, real sexuality, my dude. <laughs> like, if if you find two guys like really going at it, or and, and you find that sexually appealing as as like a as like a inserting yourself into the situation and you are same uh and, and uh you consider yourself a straight guy right and you're like oh man i really like two two guys going at it i wish i was there like you're probably not straight i'm just tossing that out there which is fine um might might not be something that comes to the surface <laughs> get it but um uh i don't i think you should consider the fact that your sexuality is invested in that now um you know maybe that's not the case for everybody but i would say that there's probably an aspect of you that let's just say you're not a you're not a you're not a one on the Kinsey scale uh, at that point, okay? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All of those things, of course, are rampant in pornography, and many of them not only elevate dopamine, like anxiety, shock, surprise, shame, etc., but they also boost your stress hormones and neurotransmitters, and that ends up increasing your excitement and amplifying the effects of the dopamine. And over time, I kid you not, your brain can start to confuse feelings of anxiety or riskiness with feelings of sexual arousal. And this explains why pornography addicts often escalate into watching more extreme and more... It's not confusing... I don't know. It's not confusing aspects of anxiety or danger with sexuality or sexual arousal. It literally is that that is sexually arousing. I, I, it's not confusing shocking content because they need that extra neurochemical boost it also explains why if you've ever cite a damn source for this shit john he tries but he's felt <laughs> suddenly stressed out by something and your first instinct is Paul, to watch pornography fun. you're like what the hell it's because you built that association in your brain the common phrase is neurons that fire together wire together and if you amplify the effects of the dopamine with these neurochemicals then what's going to happen is that and then when something totally random happens to you that stresses you out has nothing to do with that you'll feel compelled to watch pornography because you've rewired your brain literally your brain will have confused anxiety or riskiness for sexual arousal that's not how that works Usually people turn to porn not because they're like, ooh, I am anxious, therefore porn. It's usually it's usually to uh, – people seek out – surprise, surprise. Um, people seek out uh, ways to self-medicate uh, at times. And did you know that – did you know that, that, that a, a little bit of a splooge uh, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a rub out, you know, play, play DJ Vaggie clit um, – which is DJ Jazzy Jeff's uh, uh, alter ego. Um, <laughs> you know, look if you're trying if you're trying to 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 rub one out in whatever way, trying to get off. Uh, part of that's probably stress relief, not not. Ooh, I'm stressful. Therefore, I am. I want to ride the dragon, so to speak. Like, <laughs> no, it's it's usually a way to mitigate the experience, not to exacerbate the experience. Come on, bro. Speaking of stress, there's this myth that pornography is good because it relieves stress. First of all, you have to laugh at the utter state of the coom brain. Like, yeah, dude, that's why you're watching porn ten times a week. You're just stressed out. Like. I mean, some people are that stressed out. I'm not, but... Three fault and thanks for the 50 biddies. Uh, curiosity, exploration, distraction, psychological clearing of the head, all kinds of reasons. Degenerate urges usually in on that list. For, I know, right? Like, 
like and, and we're all pretty honest, I think, about about how we're feeling about sexuality in this discussion. And I don't think it's, boy, I just need to see what the latest hot video on Pornhub is. I was trying to think of a different one than Pornhub. Uh, uh, U-Porn. Whatever. What, <laughs> those are rookie numbers. Rookie numbers. Um yeah, sure, whatever. I, hey, I don't want to know your favorite sites, guys. I wasn't, this was not, oh, Jesus. All righty. No, go for a run, take a bath, do something else. Like, at least be honest with yourself that watching <laughs> pornography to relieve stress is just you trying to justify your addiction. And that aside, it doesn't actually relieve stress because as we'll get into, it literally rewires your brain to make you more miserable. So even if you can achieve that temporary relief, it will soon go away. And your baseline levels of stress and general despair are going to be much higher if you're using pornography. And I have to stress this point again, which is that given the incredibly addictive nature of pornography and how widespread that addiction is in our society, it's not only possible, but probable that anyone arguing its benefits is only trying to justify their addiction. It really is that simple. I would never listen to a cigarette addict tell me that cigarettes are good, or at the very least not bad, the same way that I would never listen to a pornography addict tell me that their addiction is the same. Like, they're Ugh, but I don't. I'm not addicted to porn, though. I don't really. I I'd be very surprised if if it was twenty twenty four to thirty six times a year, like like if it exceeded that sort of sort of threshold. It's really not that often <laughs> for me. Like like. It just depends. It just really depends. Um, not a, not a big thing. I mean, maybe when I was a teenager, it was a little bit more. Um, I I I am silence porn addict. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I I smoke way more weed than I than I jack off. <laughs> Definitely, way more. Uh, wait, why'd you wait? What did it say? BB wait why did you why did you why did you delete that uh that's probably fine uh unless it's like against TOS or something 24 to 36 a day wowzers that's too much that's too much their judgment is clouded by the addiction their prefrontal cortex has been damaged and compromised we just went over the details of that but back to the supernormal stimulus the concept we discussed earlier basically the danger lies when you have something that is registered in our brains as especially valuable to us something that is an artificially exaggerated version of something that our brains are wired to find irresistible and then that is available conveniently in limitless supply which can I'm actually always watch for never doing anything else true never be found in nature and it comes in limitless varieties that's the novelty we talked about earlier and as a result of these things we're chronically over consuming it there are two components in our society that first come to mind when talking about this. Uh, first one is junk food and then pornography. Junk food is already recognized to be a super normal stimulus. Uh, you know, we're all fat and gross as a result of it. And there's an argument to be made. Well, John, it may come as a shock to you. I'm not a big junk food eater either. I'm, I'm, I'm just a fatty boom balani because I am sedentary due to uh, multiple injuries mostly. Like my back is a really big problem right now. I took uh, a thousand milligrams of ibuprofen actually just to sit here because I pulled my back. I got, I got really stubborn, kept doing things with my hurt back, and now it's been fucked for quite some time. Um, my, my ankle hurts as well. But um, I am a big time slut for veggies. Big time slut. And they don't make you a fatty boom balani. Uh, but I also like carbs a lot, too. Like, who, who doesn't love a fucking bread or a cheese or something? That happens. Not really big into the sugary drink, so I don't get a lot of calories from that. But really what it is is it hurts to move, John. Um, and there's a lot of people that are, that uh, you know, have, have things going on with their lives that aren't just junk food and masturbating. I don't do either of those things very often. I do fuck a little bit. And that that's been that's been happening. So sorry about that. And not for procreative purposes, okay? <laughs> uh, your boy ain't trying to procreate, okay? It's all about the cumin. But um, uh, uh, speaking of which, I'm actually in cum debt right now, so I'm gonna have to uh, gonna have to make 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 up for that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and so um, yeah, and potatoes are good. Uh, pasta, pasta is okay. Pasta and penis are my weakness. Jesus Christ. Um, uh, but yeah, like, like it's just, it's just a thing, man. Like, like everyone's got different shit going on, bro. I don't know why he's got to, I don't know why he's got to always do this, this sort of like, he just blankets people. It's too, it's too hard for conservative brains to have any nuance on this. There are absolutely people that are addicted to porn. Most people are not. That's a, that's just, it's just fine.
made that the government subsidizes junk food so that we're all too fat and lazy to do something about it. I, of course, I would never make that argument the same way that I would never make the argument that the government enables widespread pornography access in order to keep us depressed, pacified, and distracted because I know that the government always has my best interest at heart. I live in Michigan. Are you kidding me? The point is that pornography is actually more potent. I live in Michigan too, bro. Super normal stimulus than junk food is simply because of its nature, namely the fact that it costs less, can be accessed with a few clicks at any time from practically anywhere. There's no precise physical limits on its consumption, whereas you have to eventually stop eating because your stomach has a capacity. You can just keep watching pornography until you like pass out or something. This is no, my balls have a limit. I I can only I can only like I'm not I'm not a look. Hey, unless there's someone else exerting effort on me, okay. The likelihood that I'm gonna be able to get off multiple times to something like porn at this point is pretty low for me, okay. Um, <laughs> like it's porn's not that good for me. It might be good for you. It's not that good for me, John. Um, for me, I need I need someone else doing stuff like stuff I don't expect, right? Like I, I'm in charge of my hand. I, I I need someone else to do stuff, and I just can't. I don't know. I'm trying to recall the last time that it's been like like three times in a day, and I, it's been a long, long time. Um, I just at a certain point, it's just like not only is the desire really not there, um, I'd have to be pretty goddamn uh, horny. To, to, to do that. Um, but also, it's it's like, it's it's not all about that. It can be. There's times when you're just like, I'm, I'm fucking nasty today. I'm a nasty coomer. But like other days, it's just like, I just like being, you know, near a person. And like, <laughs> it's just how it's, how, it's, how it's manifested in my life before. You're just like, Man, I just really like this this sort of like thing. Sometimes it's just it's fuck, but sometimes it's sex. Very rarely is it making love, but I've done that too. Very romantic chat. Very very romantic. Uh, but usually, I'd say most. What would you say? You fuck more or have sex more in your life? Making love is very rare for most people. It's 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 a it's a very special occasion. Um, it's only happened to me a couple times in in my life. But I don't think I fuck more than I have sex. Right, I feel like fucking is like is like a like I'm being nasty, like I'm really we're we're really really getting after it. You know what I mean? Where sex is more of like a, like I I laugh a lot in bed. It's a thing. I think I sex more often. So where it's not like it's not like super serious or anything. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's it's just it's it's fun. It's fun and it's a thing you can do with another consenting adult or more. And uh, it's just fun. It's just a good thing. I don't know. It's. You're a love maker. All I do is either fuck or make love. Wow. No just happy fun sex, huh? Well, I gotta say, you and me goth crocs, we're probably not compatible. That's all right, though. I'm three for three this month. What, three for three this month? What does that even mean? Oh, you've made, oh, you've made love, fucked, and sex. Okay. Nice. This is where we get back into the parallels to drug addiction. I, I was think I didn't know what you meant. Also the rats, because we actually have research that shows that methamphetamine and cocaine hijack the same reward center nerve cells that evolved for sexual conditioning. And some of these studies have shown that sex to completion shrinks the cells that pump dopamine through the reward circuit, and also that those dopamine producing nerve cells shrink with heroin addiction. So what does that mean? Well, the reason that drugs like methamphetamine and heroin are compelling is that they hijack the precise mechanisms in our brain that are designed for sex. So while it's true that there are other pleasures that activate the reward center of our brain, the fact is that the nerve cells don't overlap nearly as closely as they do with sex, which is why non-sexual natural rewards feel different and less compelling. So Sex is the most compelling given the hardware of our brain, and drugs are incredibly compelling because they hijack that hardware and overload it, basically. I mean, it's literally just making drugs and sex sound really good. Like, back to back. Hey, both of these things are good. You should do them. <laughs> like, what? Coming is bad. Yeah, he doesn't like that. Don't do that. Unless it's for procreative purposes, okay? And so sexual arousal and orgasm induce higher levels of dopamine and opioids than any other natural reward, but there yeah. are other components below our conscious awareness that play a role as well. For example, uh, there's a protein that accumulates through sex and drug use. <laughs> it's called coom. Called delta Fos B. Oh, we were thinking about different proteins. And it activates genes involved with addiction, and the molecular changes that it generates are nearly identical <laughs> for both sexual conditioning and chronic use of drugs. So regardless of what you're abusing, high levels of delta Fos B accumulate and rewire the brain to pursue more of that thing, which is how addictive drugs co-opt the learning mechanisms um, in our brain that are designed to make us pursue sexual activity. And by the way, this is related to why if you look at brain scans of drug addicts compared to brain scans of pornography users, but not addicts, they're practically identical. But anyways, the climax of that sexual activity causes lots of temporary neurological and hormonal changes to occur, upon which I don't really care to elaborate since the political implications from the neurochemistry of the orgasm, heck off commie, is something that I was really looking forward to covering at a later time. The political implications of the orgasm? So if you if you 
if you if you come more often, you're going to be a leftist. It's true. Taking bets on whether John starts giving medical advice without disclaiming it. Oh, he's already done that a million times, so yeah. He's basically saying that having sex in general is addictive. I mean, in a way, sure, in that we like doing it generally. Not everyone does those. <laughs> I don't know. Like, even even people that are ace enjoy sex from time to time, you know what I mean? But it's not like the same. It's not the same. But I don't know. <laughs> it seems weird to be this anti-fuck. I don't know. That's the highbrow content that the people want. But we do know that these changes do not occur with any other natural rewards. And we know that this is done by our brain so that we know the difference between sexual activity and drinking a milkshake. But we also know that dopamine plays a very significant role in this. Yeah. And we'll actually just debunk this right now because there's this common argument about pornography addiction and dopamine. And it's literally, well, lots of different things raise your dopamine levels. So there's no difference between watching pornography and watching a sunset. And we actually tested that theory about 20 years ago. And it turns out that it's total BS. Uh, we did a study with brain scans and it found that cocaine addicts had nearly identical brain patterns when viewing images of pornography and images of crack pipes. And also <coughs> that everyone had the same brain activation patterns for viewing pornography, so connect the dots there. And finally, that the patterns were completely different for looking at sunsets. The point being that drugs and sex can activate these sex neurons in your brain without actual sex. And sunsets can't, you idiot. It is obvious that our most powerful natural... Re well, sure you could, though. What if you only fuck during sunsets and then you'd Pavlov into that? I mean, I don't know. Uh, maybe they always have sex when they when they do crack. I don't know. Uh, we will all sleep well tonight that we are all winning in the marketplace of the bedroom. Yes, true. Uh, I feel like sex is addictive in the same way weed is addictive. Like not not like cigs or heroin is it? Yeah, it just feels good. That's it. Uh, although again, with for ball havers, it is it is it does feel more like a need at times uh, than a desire. If that makes sense. Like there's sometimes we've talked about this. We talked about this earlier. I'm gonna talk about it again, uh, uh, but through a different lens, I guess. Um, insofar as the like, I just need it, like that sort of thing. It's not meant to be manipulative. It really does feel like that sometimes. Um, not super, not like not in the way that it validates like really hyper pressuring somebody, uh, but definitely enough to ask and be disappointed if they say no, <laughs> like uh, which is fine. You get to be disappointed, it, but you, you know they get to say no. That's also fine. Um, uh, in the in a way that uh, uh, it like it is a biological necessity for people with balls to not have full balls. It's just like <laughs> I don't I don't know how to describe that in any way. It is a real. It, it is a real thing that is a real sensation. Um, that said, uh, uh, you do not have to feel pity for someone like that. It is just a. It's just a kindness you can extend that is very much appreciated uh, uh, when the when the when the feeling arises. Does that make sense? But Jake, I can't make a baby with my husband, so gay sex isn't biologically imperative. Checkmate, libs. No, I feel like your full balls are definitely a biological imperative. Um, <laughs> Your body will purge it on its own. Yeah, exactly. And if you've ever had, if you have balls, the likelihood that you've had a wet dream is high. And and I, I think I speak for all of us when we say uh, wet dreams are not ideal. Not a big fan of them. So uh, if we could just, if we could just, yeah, nocturnal emissions, sure. Uh, it's a wet dream. But yeah, um, yeah. I have literally never done that. I think it's, shut up, Avotion. Goddamn Coomer. Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not a really good time. They're not a good time. It might be good in the dream. It might be good during the dream. And then it's, for me, and it's happened a handful of times in my life, but they're sort of flashbulb moments a little bit, in that, for me, it's right, it's that first sort of boop, that, 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 the, the, the first stroke after the vinegar strokes, if you know what I'm saying, that first boop. Where, where my brain gets lucid and I go, oh, no, I'm sleeping. This isn't real. <laughs> like, And so the not only that, the orgasm's bad. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not good. It's not good. And then you got to you know, like, kind of clean up everything. Yeah, it's not good. I, I, I get – it's almost like having post – it's having post-cum clarity, post-nut clarity, mid-nut. It's really bad. Not a good thing. Yeah, I mean, if you've never had a wet dream, cool. But uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's not a good thing. It hasn't happened in quite some time, but um, uh, when it does happen, it's bad, in my opinion. You come in the game, you come in real life. <laughs> Enforcer is orgasm, which means that there's no neurological equivalent to streaming and masturbating to pornography. You can do drugs, you can drink, you can play video games, you can do whatever you want to elevate your dopamine, but none of that will have the. Why are we talking about this? What are you talking about? It's just. First of all, we're talking about this because it's fine to talk about. Uh, second of all, we're talking about this because it's literally the uh, the topic of the of the of the episode. 
you just read the thing? Come on. Power to sculpt your sexual brain circuitry the way that pornography does, especially if you're watching it at a young age when your brain is the most plastic and susceptible to that. And this is where it starts to get kind of dangerous because you have to take into account the binge mechanism that is programmed into your brain for what your brain perceives will help your survival, things like food and sex. And whenever you binge things like food and sex, your brain thinks that you've hit the jackpot and it neurochemically reacts to incentivize you to keep going. Like it literally overrides any instinct to stop because you're full or because you've had enough. So this being the case, you can understand the problem that we've created in the last 15 years where your brain thinks that internet pornography has provided to it conceivably endless mating opportunities, so to speak. As long as you have an internet connection, you can go forever and you'll never consume all the available content and your brain was not designed nor is it prepared to handle that kind of nonstop stimulation. So what <laughs> guy who makes internet videos for a living is upset that there's too much stimulation on the internet. What does it do? What does the brain, particularly the young male brain, do when it has unlimited access to a super stimulating reward that it never evolved to handle? It tends to adapt, but not in a good way. Remember what we just talked about with the substance or chemical addictions? How it restructures the brain? Works the same way with behavioral addictions. We just covered how sexual arousal and addictive drugs like meth and cocaine stimulate the same group <laughs> of reward system nerve cells. Bro, coming is not the same thing as meth. It just isn't. While triggering the same mechanisms in your brain that make you crave more. And so given that, it's not surprising that sexual conditioning through pornography and drug use involve the same general brain changes, which are changes involving sensitization. Amazing. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. Basically, the neurochemical events that create sensitization are caused by spikes of dopamine, but the actual thing in your brain that produces it is our friend from earlier, that protein, uh, delta phosb. And essentially what happens is that dopamine surges trigger the production of delta phosb, and it then slowly accumulates in the reward circuitry of your brain in proportion to the amount of dopamine that you release when you chronically... Have you ever done so much research on coming that you become anti-coomer? That's wild. Wild stuff. Yeah, a guy a guy who is totally doesn't doesn't use porn and doesn't want to doesn't want to do the cummies has agonized about the both of those things so much so that he made an almost 2-hour video on the topic. Come on, bro. <laughs> You're accumulating a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information here, uh, John. <laughs> Strange. We indulge in your natural reward of choice, sex, junk food, those drugs that we mentioned earlier, whatever. And the protein delta phosphate is referred to as a transcription factor because it activates a very specific set of genes to physically and chemically alter the reward circuitry of your brain in order to chase that dopamine. It essentially reacts to the behavior that triggers the dopamine release in order to program your brain to remember and then want to repeat those behaviors. And so with things okay. like pornography, given the way that it exists, you know, that we talked about earlier, your brain ends up being literally rewired to exponentially crave whatever you've been binging on. So that's where you get into a spiral where you want something, you do it, you secrete lots of dopamine, causes delta phosphate to accumulate, that makes the initial urge even stronger, then it rinses and repeats, and it gets stronger every time. This is based on the phrase that we mentioned earlier, um, neurons that fire together, wire together, because your brain will strengthen the connection of those cells with repeated activation. And when you link... That's just the Pavlov effect, really, in my... Uh, okay, that's what it sounds like. Link together the nerve cells for sexual excitement with the nerve cells for storing the information associated with that, which would be what you're watching, where you're Lobster watching it, how you're melts, watching it, etc. It further cements the whole process in your brain, because now you'll have totally... Just come! <laughs> ...normal things in your life serving as triggers, which I know is something that we laugh at whenever the left says it, but it's a real thing. So, if your parents leave, and you suddenly have an urge to watch pornography, if you're on your phone, you suddenly have that urge, whatever it may be in your case, that's why. Your brain has strengthened the association between your sexual excitement and the things that exist independently of and adjacent to that excitement which makes it so that when you I, I would never have thought of that situation unless I had lived it Her ramble was just a and uh, thanks for following John John here giving a very specific example of when my parents leave I just really want to pull my phone out and watch porn brother I think I think this you're drawing from personal experience here and that's okay I think we I, I, or because you're finally alone right like I don't know <laughs> I don't understand. Why does this have to be two hours long? <laughs> You notice those things, or maybe even when you don't notice them, it triggers sexual excitement regardless because you have rewired your brain. Literally the same way that heroin addicts can be triggered by the sight of needles, alcoholics can be triggered by the smell of alcohol. It's the same brain mechanisms. And these brain changes tend to keep us over-consuming because your brain wasn't designed oh to handle God, this dude. level of stimuli. And so it thinks it's just temporarily binging. It just it doesn't have the capacity to sustainably handle the infinite supply of these supernormal stimuli. And this leads to both addiction and sexual conditioning. So with this, there's good and bad news. The good news is that when you break your addiction, your levels of delta phosphate will drop to normal levels after about two months. But the bad news is that the neurological pathways that have been sensitized will remain as such for much longer and possibly even for your whole life, which means that eventually, yeah, the cravings won't be as strong, but if you give into them again, you'll be back to square one pretty quickly. And I know this might be boring or confusing, but this in itself completely destroys the idea that pornography addiction does not exist. What Do people actually say that pornography addiction doesn't exist? Because you can be addicted to all sorts of shit. It doesn't exist into the in the extent that he believes it does is the difference. Seems strange. 
The fact that Delta Phosby accumulates I'm in the reward center of the brain so is now considered to be a sustained molecular switch for both behavioral and chemical addictions. And anyone who tells you otherwise is coping because they're slaves to their carnal desires. <laughs> now here's where it starts to get bad. Hey, hey, any slaves to carnal desires in chat? Hey, can I get a copy in chat if you're a slave to your carnal desires? I didn't realize that John Doyle thought of masturbation the same way Batman thinks of killing the Joker. <laughs> hey, any, any carnal desirers in chat? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at you. Oh, yeah. All sorts of you in here. Slaves to your carnal desires. Sure, I put copies in there as well. No problem. But I'm going to shame you, not me. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Ironically, we're all addicted to good old vitamin D. Thank you, sunshine. Ah, yes. Addicted to Diet Coke? I could stop whenever I want. I would love a Diet Coke right now. That would be amazing. Because once you're stuck in that cycle... Magnetar, thanks for that. In 19 months, my friend. ...where you're craving it, and then the more you indulge in it, the more you crave it, etc. Your brain actually has a mechanism to try to get you to chill out. And it's a molecule called CREB, we'll call it CREB. And it dampens your pleasure response, basically, by inhibiting dopamine. And it's your brain's way of trying to make you chill out on whatever you're binging on, make it less enjoyable so you just kind of relax for a second. And this molecule is actually produced alongside delta phosphate when you secrete high levels of dopamine. And this is done because at the end of the day, your body's just trying to help you out a little bit, trying to keep you under control, trying to tell you a couple thousand years ago that it's time to leave the blueberry bush, go check on the kids, whatever it may be. But that the blueberry bush it was long before the utter catastrophe of high-speed internet. So now you have these incredibly powerful reinforcers that override those satiation mechanisms in your brain due to the manner in which they exist. The blueberry bush is much different than an evening spent on Pornhub. What? While drinking Baja Blast and smoking marijuana, basically. Wow, that sounds fucking perfect. That sounds fucking perfect. I really want Taco Bell now. That's how that worked. I've been Pavloved. I've been Pavloved. I want Taco Bell. I want a Baja Blast. I would like to uh, get high. I don't really want to masturbate, but we'll see where the night takes us. <laughs> uh, no, not not the not the person Baja Blast. Although I will hang out. Um, but we were talking about masturbating, so now I'm uncomfortable. Um, I had never considered um, subjecting uh, uh, anyone to that. <laughs> I think I think maybe I'll enjoy a Baja Blast uh, near Baja Blast. How about that? Um, but I, I, we're gonna save we're gonna save the other stuff for uh, for uh, uh, a more private time. Let's say that um, <laughs> Louis C K over here. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Uh, Hannah posted dildos on Twitter earlier today. Uh oh! Oh no! Uh oh! Thrace, thanks for the 50 bits. This video brought to you by the new Crunchwrap Supreme, now with extra sour cream. <laughs> I really do want one. I really, really do want one. How late How late are they open on DoorDash? What's? I don't really want one right this second. I just want one in general. Does that make sense? Like, I'm not hungry right this second. Mostly it's about the Baja Blast, so I'm totally honest. Uh, they close 2.30 a.m. Hell yeah, dude. I'm going to order that later. Um, Baja Blast and tacos. Hey, I think everybody really wants to drink a Baja Blast tonight. Seriously, that stuff is... Now, that stuff is crack. I like the Zero one without the, all the sugar in it, but I get it if you go the other way, you know what I'm saying? And this results in desensitization, or in other words, tolerance, which as we know just means that you need more of something to achieve the same effect. And as we also know, this is a key feature... Fuck you, I'm on a diet. They make a Zero Sugar one. Just drink that. The Zero Sugar one is delicious. ...of addiction. And with pornography, that might mean watching more of it, watching more extreme versions of it, whatever it may be. And we've already talked about how that type of increased stimulation will elevate your dopamine and confuse you emotionally, etc. But here's a huge takeaway, probably even the biggest takeaway for the average viewer. And that is the fact that the effects of Kreb are not limited to just pornography. Because it doesn't exist just for pornography. It exists to dull the effects yeah, of pleasure. Rublum. And as a result of this, you will start to know... Fellow diet Dr. Pepper or Rublum in chat. Fuck yeah. ...notice that things in your life that you used to enjoy, like hanging out with your friends, watching movies, playing video games, whatever, you'll notice that they aren't as enjoyable to you anymore. They seem less interesting or even dull. That's because of CREB. It leaves you bored and less satisfied with your normal life and its activities, which leaves you searching for and prioritizing whatever can elevate your dopamine just so you can feel something again, which for many of us means watching pornography. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself, now, wait a minute. How can watching pornography increase and decrease my dopamine levels at the same time? Good question. It all comes down to the sequence of events. That's uh, the increase of dopamine activity. All right. Sensitive Explain to us the sequence of events of fapping, John Doyle. Please. Please do. 
desensitization in alpha phosb, and then there's a decrease of dopamine activity with Let's desensitization in crab. And so for this to make sense, you kind of have to understand, you know, the difference in how your brain regards what you want versus what it likes. So basically, when you're triggered by something to be sexually aroused, the sensitization will cause your dopamine to be spiked. You'll have really strong mm. cravings before you actually start indulging them. Hell yeah. Remember that dopamine is the searching for pleasure chemical, yeah. not simply just the pleasure chemical. Yeah, having sexual having sexual cravings is bad, chat. Step one, sexy sex. That's a little careless whisper for you, chat. You're welcome. Can't play it on stream, DMCA, but I can poorly do it with my mouth. And then once you indulge those cravings, less dopamine um, and less opioids are secreted, uh, which is the desensitization, which makes it less pleasurable to you than before, which increases your cravings for more, et cetera. So it's a dangerous cycle to get into because it simultaneously drives your compulsive use while decreasing the fulfillment that you get from that use, along with from everyday activities in general, which will make you numb and miserable over time. Look, look, this is implying, okay, uh, some broader things that uh, that I just need to clear, clear the air about, okay? I got to be honest with you. I am not I am not desensitized to um let's say certain skills okay that are uh, employed on me from time to time <laughs> I am not desensitized to these things okay no matter how many times they happen all right in fact in fact try to desensitize me try it no, we're not talking about back massages, okay? I'm 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 just saying, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yes, hugs. Hugs. When Sarah when Sarah gives me a hug, I am like, yeah. This is definitely going to make me desensitized. Alexa play Wicked Game by Chris Isaac. I don't know what that means, but I'm glad that you gave me biddies. Uh Jake, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you be more specific? Ah, uh, yes. Um you're young, give it time. I'm in my 30s. I feel like, I feel like, as long as the, as long as the enthusiasm is there in the act, a lifelong love of mine will always be uh, uh, a hug. You know what I'm saying? Uh, really low hugs. Yeah, a low hug. Um, yes. Um, and also, I don't think I'm ever going to be upset about uh, providing a reciprocal low hug. I, I don't I don't think I'm ever going to not like that. As a hug enthusiast, as a as a lover of any and all arms. Uh oh yeah, uh, a mouth hug if you will. Sure, uh, a mouth hug. Um um. A low, a low trajectory mouth hug. I am for both receiving and giving, uh, and it has yet to desensitize me. But you can definitely, absolutely, if you want to, try to get me to no longer find enjoyment out of that. I will take one for the team here. Um, look, as 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 often as you'd like, uh, I will for science. Um, allow allow me to become the guinea pig on on whether or not I can I can no longer love a, 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 a low trajectory mouth hug. Okay, I am a patriot. That's actually you're right. I'm pretty much a, a, a patriot. You're totally right. Yeah. <laughs> and then John here saying that low trajectory mouth hugs are bad for you. I don't really understand that. Bet you wouldn't enjoy one from me. Well, ooh. You're too. You're. You're not. You're not. You're not. You're not ladylike enough, of ocean. You gotta get. You gotta become more of a lady. Okay. I like. A, I like a good. I like. A, I like a. I'm more of a, a. A seeker of the. The feminine mouth hug. I'm sorry. Uh, you're just uh, surprisingly. This is the first time you've ever been told this, of ocean. Uh, you are far too masculine for my tastes. As a. As a. As a twinky Spider-Man, you are beyond my threshold of masculinity. You're pretty high T. Um, Zoe Rose, thanks for the private 22 months. Thank you. Cacao Juniper, thanks for the 100 biddies. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> I love emotion to death, by the way. Um, really fantastic human person. So, uh, uh, still not into the mouth hugs. That's okay. I'll give you a regular, I'll give you a regular hug though. And not like a bro hug where I'm, where I'm not going to overstay. I'm definitely going to overstay 
and give you a nice good squeeze. And this can be corroborated by brain scans that show that pornography addicts have greater activation in the reward systems during the craving phase, but also that they don't actually enjoy pornography more than people who aren't addicted to it. So now, given what we know about how the brain is affected, do you understand how <laughs> terrible this is, especially for young people, people whose brains are still the most plastic, whose brains are still developing? We are the guinea pigs. We are experiencing a sexual conditioning that our parents could not have even begun to emulate with their Playboys and VHS tapes. Here is the third part of his video. And now I have to ask, chat. Um, as we as we we start to we we're, we're going to finish this second part right now, um, so thank you for watching the second part of this. Um, I hopefully you don't <laughs> dismount from the content just yet because we got more to come. <laughs> but I have to ask, I have to ask, as John Doyle makes his uh, low trajectory mouth hug face, do you? Do you think we should stop around halfway, whenever, whenever section three ends, and then pick up tomorrow and just do more? Because otherwise, we're just dealing with a lot of this. Um, and I might go into uh, maybe we'll finish we'll finish the day with uh, uh, some other some other content. I have a lot of fun stuff that people sent, um, and we could watch some fun stuff. Detox from this uh, terribly. Uh, bad take person start tomorrow with this and then end with other trash tomorrow what do you think and sir thanks for the prime because i think i th yeah because I, I i feel like he did two hours of this and i feel like because i we we stop and talk to each other and i stop and and address his his bullshit it just takes a long time with this format to go through well, an hour and 42 minutes of that so uh yeah I'm so I'm so aroused by this topic. I had to subscribe to not stop the. Feed. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Thrace Fulton, thanks for the fifty bits. Split it up for those that couldn't make it tonight. This has been a long time cooming. <laughs> and plus, I do think that uh, multiple sessions of uh, of uh, uh, sex positive uh, talk is probably a really good thing that people can uh, learn. Um, and also. Um, there are some of you who, who are uh, um, not sexually active, never have been, or don't intend to, uh, and that's okay. And uh, I think we can, um, I think we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, bridge the gap here, where where either you're you you do want to, and you just haven't yet, which is absolutely fine and valid. Um, you know, uh, especially with COVID going on, it's certainly not easy for that. Uh, and then uh, if you just have no desire for it. It's interesting to talk about it because I want to know how y'all feel about that as well. Because it is, uh, it is not something that I have ever experienced. Um, just not having sexual ideation as often as I do. I don't know how it manifests in you, uh, but again, uh, as a as a method of inclusivity here, we always want to make sure when we talk about sex to include the ace people. And uh, and any versions that are in chat, which is not a bad thing, um, uh, even though it is sort of a meme sometimes. Uh, any any in incel esque, uh, hopefully not not incel culture, but if you're involuntarily celibate, that's also valid and a thing that uh, you know unless unless you're an incel. There's a difference between being involuntarily celibate and an incel. I want to involve you in the conversation as well. So stick around. We got more content for you. I love your faces. Make sure to smash the corn button.